Hey, what's going on AP people? We have a video for you today on the Civil War. We will cover everything you need to know about the Civil War to succeed in A push. One thing I want to let you know from the beginning is I will not be covering a lot of battles in this video. It's this video we're just going over what is likely to appear on your A push exam in the form of multiple choice questions and essays. All right, let's start off talking about the causes of the war. And there are many, many causes. I'm just going to list some of the big ones. So some long-term causes, we have the expansion of slavery, and that becomes a big issue as a result of Manifest Destiny in the 1840s and 1850s. Popular sovereignty is the right for individuals of a territory to vote on whether or not that territory will be free or slave, and that was a huge cause of the Civil War because fighting breaks out. We have states' rights versus federal power, and that has been an issue since the beginning of the Constitution. Ultimately, who has more power? A very famous book written by this woman, Harriet Beecher Stowe, called Uncle Tom's Cabin, was published and really turned a lot of people in the North to abolitionists. I don't know if you know this or not. She lived in Cincinnati for a while, so she hails from that great city. All right, some immediate causes that you should know. First and foremost, it is the election of Abraham Lincoln in 1860. If you take a look at this presidential map from 1860, You'll see that in not a single southern state did Lincoln win any electoral vote. So the South feels if, if a person can become president without winning a single southern state, why should we be in this country? And please keep in mind, Lincoln and the Republicans did not want to fight the Civil War because of slavery. They fought it to preserve the Union. And that's in the beginning, and it will shift. And again, Lincoln did not campaign on abolishing slavery. He campaigned on keeping slavery from expanding. And on April 12, 1861, what would have been Henry Clay's 84th birthday, had he still been alive, is the attack on Fort Sumter in South Carolina, which officially begins the Civil War. Okay, let's talk about some key terms that you should know. Conscription is a fancy word uh, for saying draft or forced, enli forced enlistment. Now, during the Civil War, substitutes could be hired for people that were drafted. So if you were drafted and you were wealthy enough, you could pay for somebody else to go in your place. And that is something that this man here did. Theodore Roosevelt Sr., Teddy Roosevelt's father, actually hired a substitute for himself in the Civil War. And Teddy Roosevelt, who loved and admired his father, said that was the one thing that his father did wrong in his entire life. We see as a result of the draft that in New York City, there are draft rights that happened in 1863 in which hundreds of people were killed. And this is, involves mostly Irish Americans and African Americans. And you'll hear a slogan during this time begin to develop, which can be applied to lots of wars. But uh, certainly this one, which said that it was a rich man's war, but a poor man's fight. All right, contraband is another term that you should know. And these are escaped slaves that crossed over into the Union from the South. And they worked at camps and often fought in the war on behalf of the Union. And finally, copperheads. Those are Democrats, usually in the North, that spoke out against the war. So they were against going to war with the South. All right, some strategies and battles you should be familiar with. The Union blockade of the South was a major thing that the Union did in the beginning. This happened when Congress was not in session, so some people argued that Abe Lincoln abused his power. Later on, we have something called the Anaconda Plan, which is developed by General Winfield Scott. And you see that this, again, is the idea of, of a blockade. And... It kind of takes the shape of a snake. So if you follow the snake around, you'll see that it's blockading all of the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. And then it will come up and cut down the Mississippi River, which would essentially cut the South in two. So it was a way to, to economically hurt the South during the war. The Battle of Antietam is one of the few battles that you should be familiar with. And this was the bloodiest day of the war. And the South withdraws. Technically, the Union wins, but they didn't really pursue the South. And this was important because this was a turning point because it helped persuade Europe to not intervene on behalf of the South. For a while, England and Britain were wondering, should they intervene on behalf of the South? And ultimately, after the Battle of Antietam, they decide not to. And also, this helps lead to the issuance of the Emancipation Proclamation, which we'll talk about right now. So the Emancipation Proclamation was issued at January 1st, 1863. So this is a little less than two years of Lincoln being in office. And here is a very famous painting which illustrates this and members of his cabinet, including this guy, Salmon P. Chase, who was his Secretary of Treasury and was also from Cincinnati. 
and one of the greatest Secretary of States ever, William Seward, right here. All right, and this freed slaves only in areas of rebellion. So th this did not free slaves everywhere, especially in the border states. We'll talk about the border states in just a moment. It only freed air slaves in areas of rebellion or the Confederate States of America, which ultimately Lincoln did not have power over, and also not in areas under Union control. So, for example, New Orleans, which was under control of the Union at this time, slaves were not freed in New Orleans. And this helped change the goal or the goals of the war. Remember, in the beginning, the war was fought to preserve the Union. This is really the first step towards abolishing slavery. This happens in 1863. All right, so who were the border states? What were the border states? Well, they were slave states that did not secede during the Civil War. So if you take a look at this map, all the blue states are free states. All the orange are Confederate states or states that had slaves that seceded. And then the yellow here are border states. You can see they're right between the border of the North and South. And they had slaves but did not secede. And that included Missouri, Kentucky, West Virginia, which comes a little later, it's formed during the Civil War, and then we have Maryland and Delaware as well. And many people in these states fought on behalf of the Union, even though they had slaves. So which states did these include? Again, know these five. It's Missouri, Kentucky, Maryland, Delaware, and West Virginia later after it is formed from Virginia. Okay, the Gettysburg Address also happens in 1863. This is issued on November 19th, 1863, and Lincoln dedicated the battlefield as a cemetery. And he referenced the Declaration of Independence in this address. And he says four score and seven years ago, which stands for 87 years ago or 87 years prior to 1863, which was 1776. In the conclusion of this, he says, we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that the government of the people, by the people, for the people shall not perish from earth. So you see here. He's saying that these people shall not have died in vain, or they should not have died for nothing, and that this nation shall have a new birth of freedom. So again, he's referencing this idea of abolishing slavery. 1863 is an important year for that between the Emancipation Proclamation and the Gettysburg Address. And here is one of two only known pictures of Abe Lincoln at the Gettysburg Address. It's like, where's Waldo? See if you can find him in here. Later I'll identify him, but take a look. See if you can point him out. Look for a guy with a beard. Oh. There's a couple beards in there. See if you can find them. All right, let's talk about African Americans in the war. Beginning in 1862, African Americans could enlist in the war. And a very famous regiment was the 54th Regiment from Massachusetts. And they were African Americans who fought in the Civil War. And if you've ever seen the movie Glory, it is based on that group of individuals. They fought in segregated units. They did not fight along with other white soldiers, although oftentimes they were commanded by white leaders. And they often did manual labor, like building and digging trenches and doing other manual work as well. And unfortunately for African Americans during most of the war, they were paid less than their white counterpart soldiers, soldiers of equal rank. Okay, women in the war. As men fought in the war, women's employment opportunities increased. And you see women increasingly becoming teachers, factory workers, and get involved in the nursing field. This is where women really begin to dominate the nursing field. We have the National Women's Loyal League, which was founded by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, two advocates of women's rights, and they hoped to abolish slavery and gain female suffrage. They did achieve one of their goals, but not both of them. Claire Barton, this famous woman here, helped distribute medical supplies during the war, and later she founded the Red Cross, which assists those in need during times of disaster and war. Okay, we'll talk about personal liberties in the war. Keep in mind, whether it's a civil war or really any war, personal liberties tend to go down during wars. Habeas corpus, what this means, and, and this is guaranteed in the Constitution, you cannot be held in jail without having charges brought against you. So if you are arrested, the government needs to tell you what you were arrested for and then get the process going to have a trial. Well, during the Civil War, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus in Maryland. So he would have people held in jail without a trial. And this is something that only Congress can suspend, but he, the president, did. So he increased the power of the presidency. In 1861, we have a court case, Ex parte Merriman, in which the court ruled the president could not suspend habeas corpus. However, Lincoln ignored the decision. And that was a decision that was made by Chief Justice Roger B. Taney. He said to Lincoln, you were wrong for suspending habeas corpus. You should not do that. You're not allowed to do that. But Lincoln ignored him and did it anyway. 
All right, newspapers in Maryland were shut down that were critical of Lincoln's. So he was harsh to those that were critical of him or the war effort. All right, we'll talk about the end of the war and the effects of the war. On April 9th, 1865, General Robert E. Lee of the South surrenders. For all intents and purposes, the Civil War is over, although some fighting still does occur. Five days later, on April 14th, Lincoln was shot, and then Vice President Johnson becomes president. And then we go through an era known as Reconstruction. And a big question about Reconstruction is who will be in charge? Will it be the presidents or will it be Congress? And I do have a video on Reconstruction if you would like to check the description for the link on that. And we also have key Reconstruction amendments to the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments. All right, that's everything you need to know about the Civil War for A-Push. Thank you very much for watching. Follow the arrow, and you will see Lincoln there right front and center of the Gettysburg Address. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Thank you very much for watching, and have a good day, guys.